I think it's on mute. I uh, just wanted to say welcome to the closed loop webinar uh, for the CB19 index. We're going to get started here in just a minute or so, just letting a, giving a chance for everyone to arrive. We'll get started here in just a second. Just doing a quick audio check and visual check. Uh, Andrew, you can hear me okay? Great. I can see your screen. We're gonna go live here in just a minute, guys. Thanks for sitting tight. Okay, I think we are ready to go. Just a couple of minutes over one o'clock central time. I wanna thank you all for attending our webinar today on our COVID-19 vulnerability index. We appreciate, we know this is a very busy time and a very difficult time for all of you. And so we certainly appreciate you taking an hour out of your day uh, to learn more about this. This is a, a really important uh, step for us and, and we uh, certainly appreciate your time. Um, our webinar today uh, is gonna have quite a few attendees. So we're gonna keep everyone on mute. Um, but I do encourage you to use the Q&A feature as much as you possibly can. We'll answer those questions. I'm going to be moderating this webinar. My name is Chris Albino, the Director of Product at Closed Loop. And so I'll uh, take a look at your questions as they're coming in. Uh, feel free to ask them throughout the webinar. Uh, we'll also stop after each slide and just make sure that no one has questions. We've got a couple of amazing panelists on today. Our Chief Health Analytics Officer, Carol McCall, is on, as well as our CEO, Andrew I. Uh, who's going to be leading as our panelists today. And then again, as I mentioned, I'll be sort of moderating any questions that you have. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Andrew to talk a little bit about the agenda today and kick off the webinar. Thanks, Chris. Uh, and thanks everyone for joining. Um, as Chris mentioned, I uh, wanted to run through a quick agenda just to set the stage. Um, first, I'd like to kind of start with bios and backgrounds uh, on my, Carol and myself and kind of the team behind uh, the C19 index. Um, we'll go over a little bit of the company history very briefly, um, and then get straight into the C19 index, the open source project, um, some of the available extensions uh, beyond the open source project, um, a little bit of what we've learned in terms of the risk factors that have been surfaced by this machine learning model, uh, and then we'll go into how folks are actually using this in the real world um, in care management and other use cases. Um, finally, we'll talk a little bit about deployment options and then um, how we can all help in furthering this project uh, to try and target uh, resources to the most vulnerable. So uh, a little bit of bios and backgrounds. Uh, again, my name's Andrew I. I'm the CEO and co-founder here at Closed Loop. Um, company's been around for about three years. Uh, prior to starting Closed Loop, I had started two other technology companies, most recently a company called Boxer that was sold to VMware back in 2015. Um, Carol McCall, who's joining us today, is the uh, brains on the call. Uh, Carol has a long history in healthcare, um, was the former CIO and VP of innovation at Humana, uh, CIO at Vanguard. Uh, Carol's an actuary, has a master's in public health. Um, she's really gonna touch on the actual predictive model, the content that we're using and how it can be used um, in population health. Uh, our CTO is also available uh, for questions via chat. Uh, Dave DiCaprio is a 15 year veteran of the healthcare analytics space. Uh, came from the Human Genome Project and MIT at the Broad Institute. Um, and just a bit more context on the company. Um, this is all that we do. 
uh, predictive analytics for healthcare and machine learning and healthcare is literally the only thing that we do. Um, most recently we were announced as one of the top 25 finalists for the CMS AI for outcomes challenge. Um, that work as well as kind of our overall platform really put us in a position to be able to act quickly in building predictive models uh, specific to COVID-19. So very briefly on the company, uh, we like to refer to closed loop as healthcare's data science platform. Really that comes down to two core pillars of technology. The first is a machine learning automation platform built specifically and only for healthcare. Um, you can think of that machine learning automation platform as a workbench for data scientists, um, specifically in healthcare to build new predictive models, better, faster, cheaper. Dave, our CTO likes to say, we spent three years building a platform so that we could build a COVID-19 model in a weekend. Um, that really is how this played out for us. Uh, in addition to that machine learning automation platform, we have a catalog of off the shelf models for common healthcare use cases. So the only work that we do is around things like predicting admissions, utilization, ED utilization and so forth, only in the healthcare vertical. So I wanna get right to what the COVID-19 vulnerability index is and just kind of high level overview of what this product or tool is, um, how it's being used and so forth. So first let's talk about what the COVID-19 vulnerability index is and what it's not. Um, this C19 vulnerability index is a predictive model, uh, a machine learning model that predicts or identifies people who have a heightened vulnerability to severe complications resulting from COVID-19. What we're specifically not predicting is who's going to catch COVID-19, where the virus is going to spread, um, capacity planning for hospitals. There are specific models um, that are out there and folks that are focused on those problems. This vulnerability index is specifically focused on identifying patients who are likely to have severe complications if they catch COVID-19. So where is that being used? Um, one of the primary target audiences and, and target use cases thus far has been in care management. So it's enabling care management teams to focus uh, specifically on folks who have a heightened sensitivity to COVID-19. Really what we're trying to do is identify those people in advance who are likely to end up on uh, ventilators and trying to help them shelter in place through care management interventions. Carol's gonna talk a bit more about the specifics of where that's being used. Um, the model is being provided open source, free of charge. Uh, you can download this today from GitHub. Um, we are also offering a free hosted model on closedloop.ai uh, for folks who don't have an IT team capable of kind of implementing that model. We'll talk about the different deployment options and uh, the specific trade-offs between those uh, a little later in the conversation. Um, this is already being deployed. Medical Home Network in Chicago was the first to roll this out uh, two weeks ago. Medical Home Network is a, uh, the largest Medicaid ACO in the country. It's a roll-up of four hospitals and nine federally qualified health centers. Uh, they're rolling this out to optimize their care management process to look specifically at folks who have uh, not only a heightened risk to COVID-19, but also uh, social, uh, social vulnerability issues that may prevent them from getting help from others. Uh, I mentioned that this is being provided free of cost. There is an enterprise kind of support option for folks who need some extra help, uh, but we'll talk a bit more about that as well. And then Chris will be posting additional resources uh, to future webinars, uh, not only for this overview, but specific to the population health and data science communities um, and how they're addressing COVID-19. And just a quick reminder, uh, Andrew and the team, for those who are just arriving, feel free to use the Q&A feature uh, within Zoom. Uh, if you have any questions, I'm gonna be moderating that channel. So post your questions there, we'll answer them throughout the webinar. Thanks, Chris. So at a very high level, um, what this, uh, C19 index is. Um, there's an, this is an open source tool that allows us to take historical claims data and use it to predict who is likely to have these severe complications related to COVID-19. Now, we specifically used um, claims data because it is available so widely in a standardized format. Um, specifically, CCLF files uh, are available to every ACO in the country. Um, and knowing that the Medicare population is one of the most vulnerable uh, we chose to build this model around that common data type. So the open source model uses claims data. Pushed, we pushed that through this uh, data science platform that we've developed at Closed Loop. And effectively what comes out the other side of that predictive model are risk scores 
and what we call contributing factors or risk factors that resulted in each individual uh, being flagged as high risk. So in the open source model, you'll see things like prior diagnosis of COPD or number of ER visits. These are the types of contributing factors that you'll see. Not only Robert is high risk, but Robert is high risk and here are the specific line items from his claims history that lead me to believe he is high risk. Ultimately, those risk scores at an individual patient level get pushed back to a spreadsheet. That spreadsheet can then be implemented into your EHR, your care management system. But what we're trying to do is sort that work list for care managers by the folks who are most likely to have severe complications so that we can try and help those folks shelter in place, not need to go out for groceries, not need to go out for toilet paper or other necessities. So that's the open source model. Um, that model can be further extended uh, if folks decide to go with a closed loop hosted version. So the closed loop platform allows us to handle not only claims data, but electronic health record data, social determinants data, prescription claims feeds, um, health information exchange data, ADT data. All day, every day, we work with those types of data sources. We can retrain this model based on a local population and whatever data sources are available to a given organization. So I mentioned medical home network as an example. Medical home networks version of this model is not only using claims data, it's using their uh, individual patient social determinants data that they collect internally and using that to provide an even richer risk score. And we'll talk about some of those results here in a minute. But as an example, if you have PHQ-9 data, if you have BMI uh, coming from your EHR, all of those uh, data points can be used in a new model that is retrained on your local population if you host with closed loop. And that can be directly integrated back to your workflow systems, uh, your EHR, your care management system, in order to prioritize work directly where uh, your care management teams or clinical staff are working every day. So at a very high level, uh, if folks are interested in looking at the, the technical details, um, there is a paper published on MedArchive that goes into granular detail on specifically where the data uh, came from that was used to train this original model, um, what some of the accuracy statistics are and so forth. Uh, for the data focused folks on the call today, um, you can see some of the different results uh, based on the open source model, as well as kind of uh, the full feature set model that's powered by the closed loop platform. Um, the original data set used in the open source model was a Medicare data set uh, from CMS. So about 1.7 million, 1.8 million lives uh, that were used uh, from that claims history. We did a holdout set of roughly 370,000 beneficiaries as our test set. And the ROCs that we're seeing are in the 0.73 to 0.91 range, uh, depending on the exact data sources used in each of these models. So this has been deployed, as I mentioned, in Chicago. Uh, in that case, the training set for that localized model was 215,000 folks with 55,000 folks in the test set. Uh, again, deployed in New York, 2.4 million folks uh, in that training set, 600,000 folks in the test set, and so on. And so this model that's published you can see kind of the results of the original open source model. And then here you're seeing some of the accuracy, accuracy statistics as this has been implemented uh, for individual cases. Cool. Uh, Andrew, just a couple of questions coming in from sure. our attendees. Uh, question one, uh, what is the training label? Are you using patient data uh, for those who have been actually diagnosed with COVID-19? Yeah, it's a great question. So I'm gonna let Carol talk about that in more detail, but the short answer is we're using proxy events so this is trained on historical data. Uh, and really what we're training on is severe complications related to respiratory infections. And Carol's gonna go into that in greater detail here in just a second. Mm -hmm. Right, and a second, a second question here from Matt uh, in our uh, attendee list. How was the response target defined to train the model? How was high risk defined and targeted? Yep, so high risk is a relative term uh, in cases of risk stratification. So we're not bucketing people into high risk yes and a high risk no. Uh, rather, every single patient in the population is scored on a relative scale from zero to 100. Um, and so what we're providing in the, uh, in the ultimate risk stratification is if you're gonna make one phone call, if you're gonna do one intervention, here's the most at risk person in the entire population. And that goes all the way from the 100th percentile 
all the way down to the the uh, one one percent, <laughs> the one percentile. One, that's right. Great questions. Other questions? Thanks, hey. Andrew. I'm going to turn this over to Carol and let her talk a bit more about the, the specific predicted outcome. Right. Um, thank you, Andrew. So before we get started, I like Chris, I want to just thank everybody for taking the time to, to take an hour out of their day. We know that everybody's busy fighting COVID and we know that everybody's concerned about family and friends. And, and it's interesting. I remember listening to the news and somebody said, every day you're going to wake up to a new world. Things are changing that fast. And with any luck, uh, we're hoping that today's going to be the day that you say, hey, today I found a new tool that we can use in this fight against COVID. So for us, that would be the, the great thing to come out of this, um, this webinar for us. So uh, back to the predicted outcomes. Clearly, as Andrew said, we don't have data on people that have been infected with the, the coronavirus. Um, but it is a virus. And because of that, it's going to share some similarities with other viruses that have known biological mechanisms and known pathophysiologies. And we've used that to identify what we call close proxy events. And so that's what the vulnerability index is predicting right now. So um, in terms of choosing those proxy events, we set out several criteria that had to be satisfied. And the first one is that it needed to be consistent with what the COVID infection was, which is to say it's a respiratory infection. It also needed to be supported by WHO guidelines and also the research um, that was coming out, some early studies uh, coming out of China um, on what COVID's impact actually are. It also needed to be consistent with the CDC guidelines. The CDC has laid out um, guidelines that define people as being at, at an elevated risk. Um, and so these proxies needed to share those risk factors um, as the ones that were highlighted by the CDC. And then last but not least, uh, we wanted these to be validated by the chief medical officers that, that, are, uh, that we partner with um, and are in other organizations with uh, thought leaders throughout the country that we had an opportunity to, to talk to. Um, and so with that having been accomplished, the specific endpoint is this. We are looking for an admission to a hospital or an intensive care unit within a short period of time, in this case, 90 days, for someone that has a primary diagnosis of pneumonia, influenza, acute bronchitis, or other respiratory infections. Now, these are all the technical specifications use ICD-10 um, codes, as well as HRQ's clinical classification software. And so for the, you know, the geeks in the crowd, um, the health informatics folks, the CCSRs are specifically, they are RSP 002, 3, 5, and 6. Carol, right. can, you talk a, can you talk a little bit about uh, just kind of balancing the data that's available in these common formats, specifically CCLF files, and kind of balancing um, the granularity of this defined outcome with the availability of that information to a, a wide kind of uh, swath of folks, right? Uh, specifically that this kind of type of data is readily available in those CCLF files. Right, so um, so to Andrew's point earlier about choosing to use claims here, um, claims is for all of the, the fuss and muss that everybody makes out of it, it is, it is a common denominator across a number of, of different organizations and specifically C, um, CMS makes available uh, claims data in a common format, these CCLF formats that that are shipped literally monthly to ACOs that are in these uh, Medicare shared savings programs throughout the country. And what that means is, is that with models that are built to take that in and using the, the common semantics and ontologies that have been built into the platform, we are able to immediately take those in and return back um, in these spreadsheets that Andrew mentioned, the scores because they use the, this common language. Any other question, questions? Carol? Yeah, question for you, Carol, coming in. Um, and this actually might be, some, might be something that you're going to be uh, touching on here, here in a second. But how yeah. have you built have you built frailty index into this model is the question that's coming in. <laughs> Somebody's been peeking ahead. Absolutely. Yeah. We, we did build frailty. in. so if you go to the next slide, um, 
this is with that endpoint, this is what the models learn. And so these are the factors that that was that the model learned were important. So on the left, you can see a list of the risk factors um, sorted there from high to low. And you can see a couple of things here immediately. Number one is that frailty, which we did build into the model, um, rose to the top. And the percentage that you see is the relative contribution that each of these factors makes um, to the prediction. Now, this particular list is at a population average. And so what it's doing is it's taking all of the different contributing factors um, across all of the people for whom predictions were made. And it's saying on average, what was the importance of that factor um, to a prediction? And an individual could have a different list of factors for any individual person. Maybe diagnosis of COPD was the most important for them, or perhaps um, a diagnosis of blood and blood you know, um, forming organs, that was the most important. But for the population, this is the list. Um, the green that's shown here, uh, means that it's consistent with a factor that was highlighted by the CDC. So from our perspective, when we first looked at this, uh, lots of green meant good. And it meant that our choice of a proxy um, was a strong one with respect to identifying shared factors that were highlighted by the CDC. On the right side, if we drill in just a little bit, what you're seeing here is that every single one of these risk factors on our platform, you're able to kind of drill into it and understand the distribution of risk for that particular factor. The one on the top here is age. And so age is one of those that we expect to see. It's the same as the CDC's kind of highlighting that. Um, and you can see that the risk here rises with age, um, but it's also kind of interesting because you see that as you move toward younger ages, you go, hey, hold on a second, what's going on here? Um, why is 65 uh, like the lowest risk? And it's interesting because the models have learned that in this particular data set, which is Medicare data, um, that people younger than 65 actually have higher risk. And the reason for that is that in Medicare anyway, um, if you're eligible for Medicare and you're under 65, then you qualified based on uh, disabled status. And the models have learned that. Um, below that though, this one, is a, it's a deeper look into frailty. And in this case, you can see that uh, the risk rises dramatically with the frailty indicator that we've created. Now, a little bit more about that frailty indicator. Um, frailty is a phenotype that's generally characterized as somebody that is weak or uh, has a fairly delicate state. And frailty, it's well recognized um, in research and has a very strong association with an increased risk of everything from infections and respiratory infections to uh, fall related injuries to worse outcomes in the ICU. Um, and, and so it's well understood, but it's, it's, not, um, it's not well measured. And so it's in fact rarely captured uh, as a part of uh, uh, EHR data and it's certainly not in claims data. But for us, the good news is, is that the feature, this particular factor, there is a validated claims-based algorithm. And so as a part of our earlier work, um, this part of the three years that Andrew is talking about, uh, we took the opportunity to actually build that factor into the platform. And so that feature, when you have claims, is automatically available for use in any model. And in this particular case, it rose to the top. Question, uh, a couple of questions for you, Carol, that are coming in. Uh, is the CDC using frailty as a risk factor? And if not, why is that something that we're including in our model? Uh, question one, and then I'll get to question two after you answer that. Right. Um, the CDC, in the, in the factors that they have listed on their website, Frailty is, is not one of the factors that's listed. And um, I haven't had a conversation with them about that, but I, I, my belief is that it's because it's a fairly complex factor. Um, and it would be difficult for somebody to look at the website and kind of go, okay, so am I frail, am I not frail? Um, and, and the reason is that there are several different components. This, this indicator, for example, has 21 different components that go into making up this factor. And that includes everything from impaired mobility to depression, to chronic skin ulcers, to gout. And every single one of those contributions has its own little score. Um, and so it's fairly complicated. And, and one of the things that the CDC strives to do is to be, is to be clear 
and to be simple so that people can look at the website and, and, and understand it without having to, to do a lot of math or to kind of wonder where they're at. Great. Uh, a couple of other questions coming in from our uh, attendees. Anthony says, what is the specific clinical activity that takes place for patients who have a high risk index? A specific clinical activity. So uh, yeah. I guess, help me Carol, understand. I think, the, I think the question may be, what do we do differently if someone has a high risk score? And mm -hmm. we're gonna talk specifically about how resources are prioritized um, here in just a second. But generally, the, the first target audience um, for these risk scores were care management teams. Um, for folks who may be outside of the clinical realm, um, care management teams are folks who uh, every day work in a, uh, large populations to identify patients who are at risk for adverse events in general. So uh, population health groups or care management teams might reach out to people who are just discharged from the hospital find those who are most vulnerable for a readmission and do things like home site visits uh, to try and prevent those readmissions. They may also be involved in chronic disease management, um, trying to predict who's most likely to have uh, an advancement in the progression of their uh, chronic diseases and they'll enroll them in chronic disease management programs. In this case, those care management teams across the country from both payers and providers are being repurposed to educate the most vulnerable as to how to stay safe and how to shelter in place. So the specific clinical activity is care managers calling on the most vulnerable people, educating them and trying to mobilize resources such that they can shelter in place. And Carol will talk more about those specific intervention programs that we're seeing from population health groups in just a second. Right. Yep. And a uh, question coming in from Kara as well uh, around the frailty uh, indicator. Mm -hmm. uh, what what frailty model are we using to calculate the frailty indicator? Can you talk a little bit about that, Carol? I mean, the, the actual specific index that's being used? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, so in, in this particular case, it's one that was actually published by uh, Segal out of Johns Hopkins uh, School of Public Health. Great. And that, that the algorithm was validated against uh, specific physiologic measures that, that were gathered and married to um, a CMS database for validation. And Carol, that's referenced in the, uh, in the technical paper as well, is that correct? Correct. Great, okay. thanks Carol. Yep, so um, if you go to the next slide, I think we can talk a little bit more about how uh, these are being used. And so as Andrew was talking about, there's a, a repurposing of, of a lot of care management teams to do this kind of outreach. And in the discussions that we've had with many of those leaders, it was interesting to see that there were several kind of common elements in their outreach playbooks. And when they would outreach to somebody, they were trying to accomplish several things that you can see listed here. And everybody's approach is a little bit different, but in general, they were trying to educate people to talk with them about COVID, do they know what it is, um, and, and to try to make sure people understood what resources were available. Another was to create a care plan. And not just to know what symptoms to look for um, and who to contact, but these are people that have uh, sometimes multiple chronic conditions. And so they wanted to make sure that they had what they needed um, to manage those conditions as well. Everything from medications to how to access telehealth. Um, absolutely critical is making sure that they knew how to promote safe practices. Do these people know how to protect themselves? Um, everything from proper hygiene and social practices to um, if they absolutely had to go out, things like always wear gloves and tips of that nature. Um, making sure they have supplies. So it's groceries and toilet paper. Make sure that they have the things that they need so that they, that they don't have to go out. Um, and to look for additional challenges. Andrew had mentioned earlier that the folks at uh, Medical Home Network, they work a lot with people that, that face additional social challenges and what they're doing is marrying this data to other information they have around social vulnerability and social isolation um, to, to see if they can reach out and make sure that those folks have what they need. Because otherwise, they just don't have the same kind of support that, that other individuals do. And last but not least, to be present. Um, in some instances, especially for people that are socially isolated, uh, the people that are doing this outreach may be their best resource. Um, and to make sure to check in regularly and, and see how things are going. 
in addition to these, um, we've also begin started to hear some things about uh, potential uses within healthcare and, and public health. Um, one of them that was interesting was use these same indices to try to protect vulnerable healthcare workers. Uh, it's well understood in the industry that healthcare workers are in fact um, some of the more, uh, some of the less healthy people in society, sometimes by uh, 10 to 15 percent on average. And so you can redeploy the activities of these uh, more vulnerable personnel um, so that they have less exposure. Another that I have been starting to see some things about is to help prioritize and triage remote care. And that's everything from home visits to mobile care units to uh, for people that are familiar with something called hospital at home. And you can begin to plan for and triage people that may need those. Uh, and the other is to help coordinate, last but not least, there's more discussion now about what it means to, you know, as we move through these, these mitigation things and start to talk about easing, how do we actually do that? Right, we can't just kind of throw open the doors and everything kind of goes back. By knowing where uh, the most vulnerable people are and who they are, I think that we can have a much smarter adaptive response um, to what we're seeing as, as the days continue to unfold. And Carol, just to, to add a bit to that and, and really make this simple, at the end of the day, what we are trying to do is identify those people that if they contract COVID-19 will end up on a ventilator, right? That these are the folks, in some cases we're seeing as much as two thirds of the risk, the actual outcomes for severe complications related to respiratory infections concentrated in the top 5% of the population. And so the key there is that these care management teams that exist all over the country, they don't have the capacity to call everyone. And the key is these types of interventions can be applied more directly, more specifically to that top three to five percent where so much of the risk is concentrated. You know, and I think a lot of times it, folks think that, well, you know, isn't everybody getting the word? Isn't everybody hearing this nonstop on TV? And the answer is these folks who are chronically ill, these folks who are predisposed, they need extra handholding. They need extra attention to say, do you specifically understand these instructions? Do you know what you're supposed to do? Yes, I know you need to get your prescriptions filled but we can help you do that without you walking down to the corner store, right? And that is the key, mobilizing resources for those folks that if they leave their house, if they contract, contract the virus, are absolutely going to end up on a ventilator. And that saves two lives, right? That saves the life of the person who never contracted the disease, and it saves the life of the person who uh, maybe we made room for with that ventilator capacity. Yeah, I think this one helps kind of bring some of this home. Sometimes we get the question, you know, so why not uh, just use the CDC guidelines? And the answer is that they're just far too broad. It's not that they're wrong, um, but, but we need much more precision to do the types of things that we're talking about. So what you see here in this, this simple pie chart is are the CDC guidelines. And um, you see that 41% of people, if you look at the Medicare population, 59% um, satisfy their guidelines and meet one or more of their criteria, 41% do not. In that 59% of people that are defined as having elevated risk, that is a huge number. That is almost 39 million people that have been identified by these criteria as saying, you have elevated risk, right? But it says no more than that. It, it fails to identify within that 39 million people who are the most vulnerable and leaves people leaves everyone trying to help in the position of saying, well, now I've got to just call them all. And with a finite capacity and a limited amount of time, it just simply can't be done. But it also doesn't need to be done. So as, as Andrew said, the poor outcomes are, are highly, highly concentrated. The top 5% of the population are carrying two thirds um, of the identified vulnerability. And so if you go here, you can say that with that precision, um, in precision modeling, that precision care management literally saves lives. So what this slide is showing you is a very specific example. So imagine that you have a 250,000 patient population and you have decided that you are gonna run at this and you're gonna give yourself three weeks to reach that top 5% and assuming conservatively that half of these people, when you reach out and you say, I'm here to help, what do you need? Half of them pay attention and they shelter in place and avoid infection. I could argue that that's conservative, but half of them say, okay, I got it. What you see are two lines. 
the red line says if you use the CDC guidance and and reach out, that that is how many people that you can impact. And the blue line is if you have this this vulnerability index, and that's the impact that you have. And what you see is that it saves an additional 1,431 lives. But to be clear, that is three times as many. It is three times as many lives that you can impact because you're able to be more precise. And that excludes these second order savings. So a bed freed up by this mechanism is one that's available for the next person. And so it's, it's, a, it's a twofer on that one. Great, just got a few questions, Carol, coming in. Um, yeah. <clears throat> so I know there is less risk in children, but for a largely pediatric population, does this model also apply, for example, asthma with multiple hospitalizations? Right, so this particular model that we're talking about here was trained on Medicare data. We are working to, to access data that brings in a broader age range. In general, where we have built those for specific uh, customers, we, we are able to apply them across all ages. Although I think in MHN's situation, they are, uh, their chief medical officer said they, they wanted to focus on adults and so are built the model for ages um, 18 and above. And just to add to that, Carol, so the first model that's been open sourced, as Carol mentioned, was trained on a population of 65 and older, uh, larger Medicare population, um, but is applicable to folks 65 and older. Um, we're going to be open sourcing a new model this week as well that's been trained on a, lar a larger population um, with a, a supported age range from 18 uh, and over. And if there are folks on the phone who uh, have data from a pediatric setting, um, we can retrain this model on our own uh, platform in as little as 24 hours. So we can take that same endpoint of severe complications related to respiratory infections, uh, retrain that on a pediatric population as well, and learn how those risk factors may differ than what we're seeing in older populations. So uh, if that's of interest, please reach out and we would love to kind of engage and see if there's some way that we can help in those pediatric settings right. as well. Uh, just to add on to that, um, in some of the early opportunities to work with, with other data sets. It was fascinating to, to see some of the risk factors that were showing up. Um, a couple of examples, one of them was uh, BMI was showing up and that, that has now surfaced as a part of the CDC criteria. Initially that wasn't there and now it is. And what was fascinating was that that was a factor that our models learned and we learned it almost simultaneously to it being released by the CDC. Another factor uh, that we saw pop up, um, which is supported by, by literature, is um, people that are pregnant or have recently been pregnant. That was also showing up as a heightened risk factor, um, which is also supported by research. Great. Uh, and just to, <clears throat> just to add to that as well, uh, you know, anyone can go to c19index.com. We're gonna have, we also have a link there to our community forum. Uh, so we'll be posting information around this uh, newly trained model with the 18 and up data. So as we make that available, uh, we will let the community know um, that that open source model is available. And we'll talk about deployment options. I think that's gonna be one of your slides, Andrew, here in just a minute. Um, another question in, are you able to take in claims data from payers other than CMS? We do that every day. So in, in, a, in a word, yes. So uh, part of what we do, as Andrew said, uh, we're built for this. This is what we do every day, all day. And so we take in claims data. Um, we have thousands of features that have already been built that leverage the, the common you know, ontologies and, and um, uh, nomenclatures that are used in claims data. And we can also take in EHR data and other types of, of healthcare specific assets. Anything that can be attached to an individual is something that we're able to harness within the platform. Great, and then uh, last question here from Ashley. Is it okay to share the information presented here today with healthcare providers? Um, I will include a link to your presentation, absolutely okay. Um, like I mentioned, you can go to c19index.com. We actually have a webinar posted there as well, so you could use that, but we'll make this information available uh, for you to share with, with anyone you'd like. And Chris, the slides are posted there as well. Um, let's make sure that the updated slides uh, get posted as well. I think they're maybe a week old at this point. Uh, thank you, Ashley. This is really fantastic, guys. Appreciate that comment.
So I wanna talk a little bit about deployment options. Um, so really three ways that you can roll out this predictive model at, and use it in your own population. Uh, the first is the open source model. Um, so that's available on GitHub. You can download it. You can see exactly how uh, that model works. You can take it, run with it, roll it out in your own infrastructure. Um, we've also provided that open source model uh, through AWS, uh, through Amazon on their SageMaker platform. So if you have an Amazon account, uh, if you're on the Amazon cloud, there's a turnkey version of this ready and hosted through SageMaker, also free of charge. Um, if you need more help, uh, or if you want to extend these models further to incorporate other data streams, um, using the closed loop platform is the fastest way to do that. If you wanna pull in EHR data, if you wanna retrain on a local population, for example, if you wanna retrain this model on a pediatric population, using the closed loop platform is gonna be the fastest way to do that. Um, we're providing that free of charge as well with email and forum support. Um, so there's been quite a lot of, of uh, interest and feedback. We're trying to keep up with that in a scalable way through email and forum support. Um, that does require signing a BAA. So if you're able to sign a BAA and share that data into our HIPAA compliant cloud, um, that data is segregated, it's kept specifically for you, uh, but we do need to sign a closed loop BAA. Um, the open source version does not require a BAA. You can take that code, run with it, install it behind your own firewall. And then finally, we're offering an enterprise version of this as well. If you need additional support from our data science or engineering teams, um, that's phone-based support. That's really helping you get this integrated quickly. Um, you can do that. We can also, in that case, negotiate a BAA. So we can start with your BAA rather than using the closed loop BAA um, in terms of the data, uh, data sharing agreement. Um, also virtual private cloud deployment support in that model. Really what this comes down to is we're trying to get this out to help as many people as quickly as we can. Um, the open source version is accurate. It takes in only claims data. It's very useful. Um, the closed loop hosted version is a bit more accurate because it takes in more features and the enterprise version allows us to help you onboard additional data streams that aren't supported in that open source model and get even more accuracy um, and more explainability and integrate that back to your workflow systems. So happy to follow up with folks in any of these three capacities um, and try and get this out to help as many people as we can. But you know, I wanna make this really simple for folks because a lot of times you know, this can sound overwhelming that, oh my gosh, what's open source mean or what's a predictive model? And we have folks of varying degrees of technical sophistication. Um, this is really simple. The easiest implementation is a spreadsheet. Really what this comes down to is you're going to send data into this, uh, into this algorithm. That algorithm is effectively an app or a script. The data that comes in in the simplest format is just spreadsheets. So you're gonna have person information based on demographics and diagnosis history. You're gonna push that into a spreadsheet. You're gonna run a script and what comes out the other side are those risk scores in a new spreadsheet. And so you're gonna see not only the risk factors but what percentile was a person in and what were the specific factors for each individual? In this case, age or prior diagnosis of heart disease. Um, in this case, age and prior diagnosis of cancer. And so all you need, the simplest version of this is a spreadsheet. And so uh, this doesn't have to be a big IT project and we're happy to help try and support you, whether that's directly through an enterprise relationship or through the forums, through the open source project, whatever we can do to get this out to as many folks as possible. So Andrew, quick question on the BAA version or the closed loop deployed version. Um, will closed loop own a copy of our patient data? No, so it, this is not a data, data aggregation play. We will hold that data for as long as it's needed to score these patients. But at any time, either case, whether you're doing a closed loop free version or the enterprise version, um, there's a SaaS service agreement. All you need to do is say, we don't, we don't wanna be involved with closed loop anymore and we destroy all of your data. That data is not used um, unless there's an explicit exception. That data is not used to retrain anyone else's models. It's segregated from everyone else's models and environments, whether you're using the free version or the enterprise version. Great, thanks Andrew. Thanks. So I wanna talk a little bit about where this is being used. We've talked about medical home network. Uh, they were the first to deploy this. Um, that's four hospitals and nine FQHCs, 250,000 Medicaid lives in Chicago. Um, I want to thank uh, Dr. Arthur Jones, 
Um, Art is the, the chief medical officer at Medical Home Network um, and was instrumental in helping us define the endpoint, get this rolled out. This is now driving uh, those care management resources in Chicago today. Um, we also have a New York health plan uh, that should be publicly announced here this week with 1.4 million lives. Um, those folks have actually allowed us to take what we learned in their uh, data set and open source that uh, to a larger population. So we're able to take that model that was trained in their population and because they've explicitly given us permission, now open source that model um, to allow us to affect a wider audience uh, of patients. It's being deployed, the open source version is being deployed uh, for a New Mexico health system uh, with 460,000 lives. That's a clinically integrated network um, in New Mexico. And then further, we're in testing and validation. This slide could be updated with another dozen. Um, in Florida uh, for uh, a value-based uh, ACO with 79,000 lives, two other value-based providers with 80,000 lives. Um, and then further, it, this is being evaluated by National Medicare Advantage plans, two of the largest health plans in the country. So this has gained quite a lot of steam in quite a short period of time in just two weeks. And that is our goal. Uh, to get this out to as many people as possible through any channel, whether that's open source, closed loop, free hosted, or um, that enterprise offering. So right now we're at over 2 million lives that are being actively affected by this um, just in that deployed and validation stage. So I, I wanna close with just kind of how you can help uh, and where folks can jump in. We've had a lot of questions from people interested in volunteering and so forth. Um, the number one thing that people can do is try this. Um, so if you take the open source version or if you engage with closed loop and you reach out to us, we can do a retrospective study with you very quickly and show you, when we look back at those historical cases, how well would this model have predicted those severe complications related to respiratory infections in your own environments? Um, Don Berwick, we love his quote. Uh, he's got a series of rules on healthcare innovation and rule number four is make early adopter activity observable. And where that is important here, we need to put more names on this slide. We need more people to say, we are testing this, we are trying this, we are evaluating this, and ultimately we have deployed this. Because that is that social proof is what's really important in people understanding this is working, right? This is helping uh, to prioritize those care management resources or some of the other use cases that Carol described. So please test and deploy the models, tell us what's working, please reach out and engage with us. Um, we're here to help, whether that's on the open source versions all the way to the enterprise versions. And for the technical folks on the phone, if you wanna dive in, if you're a healthcare data scientist and you wanna dive in and suggest new uh, risk factors that maybe could be incorporated, um, or if you're on the engineering side, there are opportunities to jump in and help out with um, additional extensions to this with EHR integration or data visualizations and so forth. Um, I think that hopefully I don't have to tell this audience anymore. We've been doing this for a few weeks, but the number one thing that everybody can do is, is just stay home uh, and tell a friend that if we can do a small part to reduce the demand on that healthcare system, if I can have fewer people showing up, I don't only save the lives of those people, right, that stayed home, that were able to shelter in place, but I might save the life of that other person that that ventilator freed up for. And we may even help impact those healthcare workers that are on the front lines that aren't overwhelmed uh, quite so much. And so um, thank you all. And, and for those of you that are in the clinical realm, thank you personally um, for what y'all are doing to, to try and help fight this as well. Great. And that answer actually answers one of our questions, Andrew, <clears throat> which is how can the community contribute back a, to this model and effort? So um, appreciate, right. you, appreciate you saying that. Uh, Another question here, how much time will it take for a facility to implement this? So we've, the, the longest part of the implementation is um, validation internally. So whether you're taking the open source model and running that with that with your IT team, or if you're going with a closed loop hosted version, from the, day, from the uh, day that we get data to we have now retrained a model based on your local population, happens in as little as 48 hours. So that pediatric example, we can take in new data, we can retrain a new model, we can give you results in as little as 48 hours. Generally what we're seeing is folks are moving very quickly. And so in as little as a week, we're getting folks who sign a BAA, send data, review results, and then start to look at rolling that out to actually drive care management. In the case of Medical Home Network, um, they were an existing customer 
for them, this was literally four days to go from uh, data onboarding all the way through to validated results that were actually driving care management. Uh, another question in from Laura, I work with Apache and I'm wondering if you have looked at any severity of illness scores as predictors. Work with, uh, in terms any, of, yeah, any severity of illness scores as predictors. Yeah, the, uh, the platform actually calculates a number of different comorbidity uh, features. So one, for example, is the Charlson comorbidity index that's a, a commonly used way of capturing um, comorbidities and people that are likely uh, kind of more vulnerable to, to severe illness. And Chris, I think Dave may not actually be on this webinar. I had hoped he would be on, but uh, that's a great question as well for the forums. So uh, we'd love to continue that conversation and folks chiming in and saying, hey, I've had success with you know, additional risk factors and other related models. Um, right. That's exactly the type of feedback we're looking for. Um, so we'd love to continue that conversation uh, through the forum. So please reach out. And um, just as a reminder here, you can always go to c19index.com. You can, you'll actually have a link there directly to our forum, which is uh, community.closedloop.ai. So encourage the discussions to happen there for sure. Um, <clears throat> another question in from the community, which is, um, so with the BAA version, so the closed loop deployed version, can you guys help with mapping our EMR data to the model's input features? 100%, yes. Mm -hmm. And in fact, that's happening in these, uh, in these production deployments already. Right, um, and just to kind of add on to that, um, all of these deployments, it, in addition to being incredibly fast, they are not once and done. It's very much a, you know, kind of a lather, rinse, repeat. And so as you get up and running, there may be additional data elements that you are either gathering or are able to bring online maybe in a, in a second round. And, and what I am really trying to encourage and what Don Berwick, just to kind of channel my inner Don, is he's always famous for saying, what are you learning? And, and I think there's so much to be learned here as more data comes in and new factors are found and allowing the machines to do what they do, which is to learn what is relevant. Um, the CDC's factors are wonderful. Um, but they are limiting. And, and I think it's, it's how fast can we learn, um, not just what, what we already know, but, but what is surprising and relevant when it comes to what is unique about uh, COVID-19. And the data that you can bring and make a part of that um, is vital. Carol, I, I just wanna to touch on that you know, step further. The question came up earlier, do you have COVID data? Is that what this is being trained on? The answer is two weeks ago, no. The answer is two weeks ago, there were dozens of cases in the United States. And so that data wasn't available. What we're now seeing um, with some of these deployments that are live in New York, and I mentioned that we're being able, we're being allowed to open source that model that we're learning from the ground in New York. That allows us two things. One, we're able now in the coming weeks to validate the accuracy of this proxy event in correctly predicting those severe impacts. And two, that allows us to retrain the model on the actual COVID-19 diagnosis. And right. so part of the benefit here is not only in grabbing this open source thing, and that will be versioned as well, but in effectively being able to gain from the insights, particularly from those regions that are ahead of you, right? If you're in Idaho, this hasn't hit you as bad as it has New York City, right? But it will. And so the key is that because we are being wired into some of these hot zones now, the insights that we're developing can be applied to those other areas um, as well as we move forward. And we're literally versioning this model uh, every 24 hours to 48 hours, um, and particularly in these enterprise deployments where we're getting new data feeds constantly. Great. We've got uh, just a few minutes left. Um, we are standing by to answer any questions that you have. Of course, you can type those questions into Q&A. Uh, we really certainly appreciate uh, everyone joining. So if you have to jump off, we totally understand. We just want to make ourselves available for you. If you have any questions, uh, please feel free to send them our way using the Q&A feature, or you can also chat, chat them in the chat box.
Great. Looks like we have answered everyone's questions. One last chance. And of course, you can always reach out to us. Um, sure. We have ways to communicate with us through c19index.com. You can sign up for our newsletter there as well. Okay. Um, well, I, I know that Carol and Andrew will have uh, some closing remarks, but I just uh, wanted to take a chance to thank you again for your time today. Um, again, we know you guys are all super busy right now and we appreciate you know, all of you who are on the front lines. Um, so thanks again for uh, joining us today. We'll hand it over to Carol and Andrew to sort of sign us off. All right, so um, I first just to echo Chris, just thank you again for, for making the time. Everybody is just incredibly busy and, um, and working incredibly hard. And as I opened with, uh, with luck, uh, today you've actually found something that, that'll be part of a new tool that you can use in, in all of your fights to help us everybody fight against COVID. So hopefully welcome to the team and uh, hopefully I'll see you in, on the boards in the community. Thanks, Carol. Yeah, I'll echo Carol and Chris and thank everyone for their time. Um, one other closing thought uh, for folks who are thinking about other applications of this. Um, Carol touched on these briefly, um, but you know, again, uh, prioritizing which healthcare workers um, really need to be frontline versus um, not on the front lines based on their vulnerability. Uh, prioritizing resources. Um, there are many applications when you look at a population level we're focused primarily on this care management use case and trying to reduce demand on the system. But if folks have other ideas for how this may be applied or other use cases beyond just identifying the vulnerable, um, our platform is designed to pull in that data and build new predictive models very, very quickly. So if there's some other way we can be helpful, please reach out. Thank you all so much for your time. Thank you for fighting uh, and joining us in this. Um, and please uh, do follow up on the, the community forums and over email and Twitter as well. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Thanks everybody.